I want to take advantage of you and uh, the fact that you have uh, written several books, but uh, one of them, uh, Marketing Outrageously, uh, just the table of contents says to me, I got to read this book. <laughs> uh, and I, can we go over it just a little bit? First off, you got a forward sure. by Mark, Mark Cuban. I suspect that uh, uh, you and Mark are, are kind of kindred spirits from because both of you are marketers. Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the day that he bought the Dallas Mavericks, I got an email from this guy who said he was Mark Cuban, who I didn't know who Mark Cuban was. Um, I mean, he was just so, you know a software rich guy at the time. And I got an email from him. He says, I just bought the Dallas Mavericks. And I got all these ideas. I'm curious what you think of them. So I said, well, send them along. So he sent me these ideas. There was like 300 of them. You know, I thought it was going to be several. So I went through each one of those saying, yeah, I like it. No, I don't like it. Yeah, maybe. And I went through that. Um, and then he sent me an email. He communicates by email a lot. He said, uh, do you have any, uh, have you written any other books? Well, I was working on Mark, he had read Ice to the Eskimos. So I said, I'm working on a book which I'm calling Marking Outrageously, and I sent him a couple of chapters. And then he said, would you want me to write the foreword? Oh my gosh. And I said, sure, because he's a celebrity, you know? Yeah, celebrity, he is. Celebrities help on those type of things. And I never met him face to face or talked to him on the phone through that whole process. Oh. <laughs> it was all through email. And I didn't meet him until the Dallas Mavericks were playing the Miami Heat in the finals in 2012, was it, or 13? And I was down at the Miami Heat game, and there was Mark Cuban. I went, mm -hmm. went up and introduced myself. You know? Wow, and you have a very special interest in the Miami Heat because your son is the head basketball coach there, right? Right. right and uh, right. I think you were telling me beforehand he now is the longest tenured head coach in the NBA. Second longest. Oh, second uh, longest. Popovich from San Antonio is the longest. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, good luck uh, to your son. I hope that they get to play on the court uh, this season. Yeah, so do I. It's just a, an unknown. But let's get back to the book, Marketing Outrageously. First chapter. Uh, do you have the guts? Ground rule number one, if you aren't willing to take a few risks in marketing, become a bean counter. <laughs> so, well, to all of my accounting <laughs> colleagues, you know, that's just fine with me. <laughs> well, most accountants don't like to take the risk, but in yeah. sometimes with marketing, um, like I've got a collection home of figurines of pigs flying. <laughs> And my wife would buy these for me every once in a while. I've got like three of them. And the first one that she gave me, she, I said, what is this? And she said, well, almost every idea that you've had, people have said, well, that'll work when pigs fly. <laughs> and the ideas work. And so, uh, you know, I, I think when we were preparing for the interview, I said, let's, uh, let's let the students share in the fun. Tell us a couple of the, the uh, uh, ideas that you've had that uh, were successful because Pigs could fly. In Dayton, Ohio, uh, after I left the Nets, I joined a group called Mandalay Baseball Properties. And th th this group of guys, we went on to own seven minor league baseball teams. The first one was the Dayton Dragons. Mm -hmm. And with the Dayton Dragons, uh, somebody had told me that in the 100 year history of minor league baseball, no team had ever sold every ticket to every game for the season. And I said, oh, gee, why don't we do that? Why don't we sell every ticket to every game? And we went ahead and we hired six salespeople. The minor league teams didn't have ticket salespeople. We trained, trained them thoroughly. And we, and we, instead of selling season tickets, because in minor league, season tickets are far more affordable than major leagues, but there's all these games. So let's say if you're a baseball fan, you have a small business and you bought a season ticket, that's 70 home games. Mm -hmm. You could have a home stretch where there's 14 straight home games. Oh. So what happens is then people you know, miss games and they can't give them away and so forth. So we decided we were going to teach our young salespeople how to trade 
buyers down. So instead of buying a full season ticket of 70 games, buying in essence a quarter season ticket of 17 games. And that way, and this came through a questioning and answer process that we, our salespeople want. And they'd say to the customer, you know, I think we can give you everything that you need, but instead of 70 games, we've got the 17 game package. So what happens is our tenants stay high because there's very few no-shows. And the problem with the no-show is if a no-show doesn't go to the game, they, their stomach doesn't show up either <laughs> in their mouth. Yeah. And so you don't get any of the concession business and you don't get the parking either. So uh, Dayton went on to sell every ticket to every game. And they've done that now for 20 years. They set a, world, a global record of consecutive sellouts. The, the team they beat was the Portland Trailblazers. The Trailblazers had 814. And I think uh, Dayton is probably up to 1,400 now. Oh my gosh. But that was, that was just doing something that's so differently where you de-emphasize season tickets. Because the whole industry was sell season tickets. And uh, another thing where we did there is the majority of the revenue from sponsorships for a minor league baseball team mm -hmm. is the outfield wall. And yeah. some teams will put out 70 signs on the outfield wall. What we did is, uh, and they'll charge nominal money, but they could get $400,000 for the season for these 70 signs. And they pay some company $10,000 to paint the signs on the outfield wall. What we did is that we made, we wanted our outfield wall to be the longest or widest TV in the world. So we made it LED and it was nine feet tall by 250 feet wide, LED. And we did, sold it to only eight sponsors at about $200,000 each. So instead of getting $400,000 per season, we would get a million six from the sponsors. The sponsors were delighted because they, we'd rotate them all at once. One sponsor would be on the board the whole, whole half inning. And then we'd switch it another half inning. And it could be animated. We hired a young film student graduate and we wanted to do animated outfield fence signs. Uh, and now other teams would say, well, we could never afford to do that, you guys. Uh, and we leased the equipment. We didn't buy it, it was well over a million dollars. We leased it for $135,000. But once you subtract $135,000 from a million six, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> so uh, a lot of the innovations then, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to make to embarrass you or anything, but but a lot of the innovations that we see today at so, so many of the parks that we used to get to go to are from you. Well, I haven't seen the whole outfield wall except at the places that we did it. You know, a lot of teams would stay with the traditional, just a one freestanding backlit sign that doesn't have the animation. And we had some really cool animations, like the Chevy dealer in Dayton when the half inning would. Uh, between innings, that whole outfield wall was a racetrack with the oh. Chevrolet. And because we had this uh, young young kid uh, who graduated from film school, he was making movies. And it was really fun between innings. So I, don't, I haven't seen that. And um, I was really surprised that other teams didn't just glom onto that and make that the rigor for every minor league ballpark. Well, heck, when you uh, when you put the pencil to the paper, the numbers sure show that it's the right thing to do. So I thought that's what you were in business for. Right. 